and more is in this beautiful little book that you can buy here at Aura that has, was published by uh, Post Post. These are uh, Eric and Isaac who are down from Sydney with us for the weekend for uh, Melbourne Design Week. And so, um, thank you very much for this beautiful work. Now let's talk about this beautiful work, <laughs> this, uh, this little book. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you wanted to capture with this book and how, how it fits in this concept of first works? Yeah, so um, I guess we're all um, uh, young architects. Um, <laughs> embarking on this journey of um, you know trying to get trying to learn how to build and learn how to design and so for us um, the whole series kind of came about as a way to actually unpack and understand um, I guess the messiness of the process of, um, of designing your first building or, and and actually in the case of like Guillermo and, and, and working with Gabrielle as well actually that it's not a very singular act and it's a very kind of collective act of um, collaboration and, and in a way, that's how we approach um, uh, our uh, publishing and kind of editing process as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for us, like very selfishly, we were wanting to know like what what other stories were out there um, in, in terms of you know making a book beyond just the, the glossy photos that you might find on you know um, uh, on, on Divisari, for example. And so we're trying to kind of um, make sense of um, yeah all of the things that kind of go into the process. So you know from all of your, you know, your site sketches and your site photos and um, the references and, and even some of the dialogue between you two. Um, and so, yeah, just... Was there, what came first? Like the idea of First Works as a series or the opportunity to write about this project? First Works came together more as a series. So we, we published a book um, last year as well um, of a friend's kind of project in Sydney um, of a film studio. Um, and... Uh, project at a bit smaller of a scale but it did give us this kind of early uh, idea of looking at how to get that first project done and taking all the responsibility on your own and then we approached or we started to talk to Guillermo about having his uh, project in Santander be the first uh, one that we did in the series and we're now still looking at kind of who we're who we want to talk to next um, but essentially yes the it was the idea for the series kind of came first and I think Eric's right it is a bit of a selfish kind of we'd like to do good buildings soon um, and we're not quite sure how to do them but I think it's a moment to kind of have an in-depth discussion on one project uh, acknowledging the mistakes and acknowledging what went well but kind of having a, a deeper dive into that rather than kind of simply this a, a surface level understanding of it. And like how hard was it to publish a book like this? Um, what are the sort of challenges? I mean, speaking as a, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, in the audience who have experience with small publishing and kind of having that creative practice that you're doing alongside your architectural design or design practice. How hard is it to get something like this off the ground? How was it for you? Uh, um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's both slow. Yeah, slow. yeah. <laughs> slow is the answer, maybe more than hard. Um, I mean, yeah. Look, we we're a group of eight people that um, probably do the work of two people, maybe. Um, and because we're all working full time, we all have other jobs. So I guess at the moment, that is how we find the publishing space. Is that it is a after work um, weekends kind of job. Um, having said that, kind of, it's a very enjoyable process and we really, really like putting the books together. Um, you know, we're not publishing heaps and heaps of things and I think we're quite ambitious in that we would love to be doing more, but again, it is kind of um, both... The, the difficulties basically is having the time um, and the funding, mm. essentially. And I guess to kind of link back to um, your question of how do you do it and how do we start, we, um, we all met at UTS. Um, and so a lot of people at Post, um, you know, like uh, Marty Callum, um, Jack Gilbanks and uh, Anna Tonkin also was a, an editor on this book. Um, we had a somewhat working relationship um, uh, prior to starting Post, but then we thought, oh, maybe it's a, a good way to kind of continue to work with each other and collaborate. And 
and also you know t um, teaching and working with Guillermo as well um, uh, we were able to kind of use I guess the, the support of UTS and um, institutions like uh, UTS um, to then um, to, to then fund but then also to then support and give um, um, different kind of avenues but not any longer not any longer <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there anymore no. yeah <laughs> yeah since now you've achieved the glory. <laughs> no, I, I think for me, this, the story is a bit more messy on the series because oh, I sure. wanted to do a book and I think they f it was worth opportunistic and, and, uh, uh, and I was already talking to Samson a little bit and I think mm. it's funny that, and then, but I would like to do this with you guys, but I think you were all very clear. We don't want to do a one-off of another of your things. And then you came up with a nice idea. Okay, we want to do a series of first works. I think, so I think, but I think that back and forth is also mm. nice. Like I think, Mm -hmm. And then you can own it. I think that is like a, the series, and that is, is never so clear. And I think that Hannah Bond was on, on that, like, yeah. it's a bit opportunistic in a way, but I think publishing always is a little bit like that. If there is an opportunity, no, because it's so hard. Guys, you don't have the continuity for the series or for the things. So I think many of the times you work on that opportunities for a dialogue mm -hmm. or opportunities for a good project or, or something like that, which I think is good. I think. Um in a certain sense, it's amazing to even see something like this come published because there's so much effort and so much passion behind a work like this. Um, I remember um, once uh, reading an interview with an actor who was talking about the director, Sofia Coppola, and said, I admire a film director so much because no one needs another movie. <laughs> no one is ever going to say, oh, we need a film. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little bit like that with um, doing a creative publishing. Like, no one is ever going to say oh, we need this is required <laughs> you're always kind of really fueling it with passion and tell us a little bit about what you think is the value of this kind of publishing maybe what is you know for you as an architect what is the value of having a book like this and also for you as publishers what do you think is really how, how do we contribute to design practice with or us personally i think we wanted to explain the book different to it's in a couple of magazines mm -hmm. but uh, we know that if we have a conversation with them the reading of it will be not ours which i think we enjoy also that there is a second mm -hmm. reading or it's both ours mm -hmm. and theirs and also it allows to have a different reading of the thing you know, there are documents that will never be published by a standard publisher or there are stories and we could also come together like invite people to write about it you no know, like the artist or my my former boss uh, and i think that's also like a it's an opportunity to tell a story of a building slightly different mm -hmm. and as they mentioned it's a collaborative project with my father and her partner my brother and me and then the the misreading of the project with them and i think that's also part of the because there are it, it's been featured in, in awards and it's been featured in other things but we want it as a and we'll do a lot of books and we like books so it was very strange that i spent so much time doing books and don't doing a book of, of the first work that we actually finished so at some point it almost was Force. I, I needed to do it personally mm -hmm. um, because yeah, there are we do five books a year, and it was very strange not to do one on something that we we were also proud of. So, but it needed to be with the right people or the right connection to be able to to explain. Otherwise, we, we would have self-published, but I think it would have been worse. And I think it's nice to be part of a series, also. And I guess also like for us um, personally, I think. The book, in a way, is um, you know the kind of culmination of a process of trying to understand something, and so um, for us, and you know, we've worked with Guillermo um, a few times before, prior to this, um, you know, on exhibitions and on other publication projects. Um, but for us, it's a really fun way for to understand you know the mess that is um, you know architectural practice, or you know, in this case of you know making your first work. And actually, what happens when you when you kind of see all of these things, and, and are there actually certain kind of like relationships and things forming? And so, in a way, you know, the book is kind of like the what happened, or just a, a document of the process, and maybe the process is uh, more important um, um, for us of kind of actually um, trying to dissect and understand. But the process without the actual building, I wouldn't. We, we wouldn't have done the book. No, no, no. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about other things that Post Post has published. So you have done some really interesting little books along the way, including one that is a comparison of Melbourne and Sydney I, rivalry in architecture. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about this? I mean, again, that was with 
Marti, but maybe um, it was really something that um, again like we worked very collaboratively with um, with uh, uh, with Guillermo and and, Oti, and, and Oti okay. as well. Um, and it was something actually you know uh, Guillermo came to us with really um, from a talk series. <laughs> it, it was like a, basically we were new here. We couldn't understand much of the rivalry in Melbourne and Sydney, but we could come here and see the Melbourne buildings and be horrified and go to Sydney and also be horrified at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we all heard that there was an amazing debate on the 80s uh, on that rivalry that they, and we, we talked to the kids that they were probably too young to, to know much about it. And we decided with a series of outrageous claims to put together a lecture series that you were always guys coming and then eventually transform into a publication. No? And there we have uh, 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 people from Sydney and people from Melbourne uh, battling uh, although I, there was not much battles despite our intentions um, <laughs> and we presented a few years ago here like also with, uh, with Eric and Jakurts and myself um, and it was almost to, to reread that part of history to try to see if that rivalry makes sense or it didn't make sense any longer probably but it still was a fun exercise to try to it was selfish to know a little bit more about the recent history of Australian architecture both in Sydney and Melbourne mm. And I think it set up a kind of a framework that Post is kind of interested in mm -hmm. moving moving forwards. So a lot of the books we've done all have at least something to do with an Australian context in a way. Um, this one maybe the most less clear link, but I think you're mm -hmm. practicing in Australia now. Regardless, I think, that, and that's part of the way we're kind of wanting to, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, contribute to a particularly an Australian discourse mm -hmm. around architecture. Um, and so I guess that's also how we're seeing kind of first works moving forward and we're kind of having those discussions about, uh, again, kind of uh, developing various connections with uh, young architects within, within an Australian context. Um, and I think we're particularly interested in the next book being a, a building in Australia and um, <laughs> looking at, what it, again, what it's like to build here and all the, the extra, or not extra, different challenges that come up. Um, from that process. But I think also something that is very clear is all of us are quite interested on the cultural production side mm -hmm. of architecture and they all like books either through us or through the teachers that taught you and mm -hmm. I think has been a good common ground via publications to, to set some of those yeah. That's right, like some of the people that you talk with, there is Jack Self who has his own publishing practice which we will review, there is Liam Young who basically works in movies Mm -hmm. architecture as movies so there is seems to me there's an interest in the expanded architecture is an expanded field of practice that is very much engaged in cultural production production of ideas as much as production of buildings is that the kind of interest yeah yeah I think um, at least my experience and I think you're the same um, kind of this these ideas or posts started vaguely emerging around the time we were in masters university um, very very interested in all of that kind of excess cultural production around architecture but not really seeing a clear place for it or how we might kind of engage with it um, in such a direct way and I guess this was kind of born out of a moment of just I guess being particularly interested. But you used to say on your website that you were on the periphery of architecture and I think this is architecture itself. And the cultural production, I think, has been always part of architecture. And I think mm. that's a slightly different. I think it's good from us or between. Oh, yeah, probably, also, probably now you are more aligned to yeah, what I'd say. Less, but less. I think when you were students, uh, you were more on the periphery of architecture. Sorry? It's true. I, I no, think that that's how it started. No, mm, I think yeah. like a, I think your second issue is an interview to Lee and Jan, and now you want to do about Australian building. I think that things mm. change, like uh, yeah, yeah, which is normal. Also, like your interests, your your mm. things. Okay. I'm gonna open up to the audience. Is there any questions um, for our guests about architectural publishing, about uh, moving from moving into practice, about first works, about publishing, about first works? Yeah. No, I'm just curious how you guys, I mean, I think I know an obvious answer about how you feel about the current state of architectural media here, but do you have any thoughts about how it could be structured or driven into being something maybe even closer to what you guys are talking about or something more productive in a way? 
Uh, well, that's a quite a good question. Um, I don't know if I have an immediate answer for it. I think more I people know. like you yeah, more collect I mean, this, put in that, the stories just... from that. And I think we can be critical with architectural media and the way they sell architecture. Mm. But at the same time, they do an important role for a wider audience. Obviously, there is a type of buildings that only fit their houses for a relatively rich people, white Australian, and that. that. But they all they do the role. The thing I think we need to have more alternative stories of what is architecture in Australia today, and I think probably there are more collectives like Post, but also the next generation. And yeah. How to find a space also within the mm. bigger institutions, which is always very hard to be honest, yeah. like both within the universities, but also within the museums. And I think the NGV sometimes tries differently. But yeah. Yeah. I suppose like that's one big challenge that we're always facing is funding and how to actually, you know, pub publishing and physical print is expensive. Um, and so actually um, finding avenues or ways of uh, actually producing books and finding time to do that is, um, we found is um, a bit of a challenge. And we've been very lucky to be working with Kiemo and, um, and previously at UTS and, um, and other institutions and now at Sydney. Um, and so um, we see that as a very important, um, uh, I guess, way of producing or kind of like funding work is through, um, I guess, uh, the support of institutions and, and grants. And, and but I think and Hannah was able also to have, Melbourne has a history, small publications that mm. they were trying mm. to say other stories, perhaps less on the architecture itself, but there has been a, there is a recent, in the recent past there has been a series of publications no, that, mm. that try to set an alternative stories to the mm. mainstream. Except that they're mostly subsidized by property developers. Developers, yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Which is, yeah. uh, but in Sydney they, that, that doesn't even happen. Mm. Uh, whether yeah. it's good well, or not, get has to find that lucrative connection. <laughs> 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 I think they, they run their numbers and it, it's so expensive that it didn't work out for them. But Kate has written in better together by Udo about Molongro and their Medici role within that, and uh, but also relates to the also relates to assembled papers, obviously, and, and, and things like that. But probably Matt can also clarify on. <laughs> on what it means to publish Australian architecture slightly different to, to Houses magazine. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously the Houses magazine, you know, architecture media institution, organisation, however to describe it, is, is funded by advertising largely, and the Institute. Mm. So there's a steady source of income there that pays for a very expensive process. You know, even though a lot of the printing nowadays for most publications is not sure, as you guys have done. This is yeah, not, this is not, uh, it's all Australia. This is Australia. Yeah. <laughs> this is, and the other one I brought you either. We try sometimes here, not, not like when it's possible. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, transition being an obvious example here in Melbourne from, from the 80s and early 90s, that was paid by an institution in our RMT. Although it started out as an independent publication, just like you guys, it was eventually kind of taken under the wing of the institution. It's expensive, and there's a, there's, a, there's a challenge as well. Like you guys move on, you know, mm. the, who picks up the, the legacy, if you like? If the EMO moves on, who keeps the momentum going? There's that institutional memory that the small team doesn't necessarily have, mm -hmm. particularly if they're struggling for funding. Well, I think that's what your constant challenge, no? Who yeah, takes yeah. care of this when somebody comes here, when somebody moves away, and how to keep at least one project that keeps alive the, the project, no? But I think also we need to be optimistic also like there are a series of student-run mm. journals coming from most of the schools in Australia that are trying to have a like Paradise a journal from former students of UTS, a Circa journal by the University of Sydney once, I think Melbourne has the, the, the two, both Melbourne, whether they are better or worse and I have my, my opinions, but uh, there is an interest in publication and there is an interest on the cultural side mm. of it. The, the Brisbane one, uh, Barbara Journal, is also interesting. So there are a, a bunch of them trying to all run. Again, very difficult to keep the momentum when the generation graduates or how they can give mm. it continuity outside the institution without the support of the, that. But I don't know. Are you, are you going to announce no, the, next, the next, the no, next no, one? No, no. <laughs> no. I thought it was time to no, 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 no. <laughs> We have are, are come accepting... to the official agreement, so we're not saying yeah. any names. Are you, so. are you accepting <laughs> being pitch or not? Like, <laughs> Wait, what? Pitch is from the audience, like a Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to just pick up on the rock. Like, it's also a bit negative, sorry. <laughs> 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 like, if you take politics and public space, which was a series, they approached RMIT and Euro, who both said no to 
publishing them, and now they've seemed to be more successful. Like in retro, they so they're self-published, and now the institutions and Euro will stop them. You know, so it's almost like the risk has to be taken by these guys because the institutions or larger publishers won't take that risk. So, like, you'll publish a lot of Leon Van Strike kind of, you know. We might have to edit the recording. <laughs> 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 practicing, not practicing in Australia. <laughs> 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 so we've got a bit of work to do. Um, the, the reality is, it's just a case of follow the money. Like, mm. it's expensive to publish, as you guys know. We're a commercial, we need to pay salaries. Mm. We don't have an institution backing us. So every time we do a book, we go door knocking, we raise funds for it. The money comes from an institution generally, it comes from the practice. If we can't get that money through an arts crowd or otherwise, the book, the, the audience here and the likelihood of selling 3,000 copies of something is almost zip. You know, you, you, especially if that thing is not a coffee table book. Um, it's in the mode of the house mm. publication or what have you. It's just not the market for it. Mm. But I think that market is also constructive. And I think we we need to be things like that. Probably more people. I think it's all it's everybody's responsibility, you not know, the publisher, us as within the institutions or not young publishing houses. And I think we need to be optimistic. It's possible. We have done books like that. It's true that sometimes we have lost money. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> mm. <laughs> not lost yeah. of the time. It's not, it's not barely always at least we come even or we and we are learning now to, how to make a little bit. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but I understand it's different constraints of a commercial publisher. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, like mm. the politics of public space is clear. But now they are fundraising up to twenty five grand, no? For Yeah, no, now everyone's on board, but yeah, and it'll probably be the same for you guys. <laughs> No, well, they wish. <laughs> yeah, we wish. Uh, fingers crossed. They operate yes, at a much yeah. smaller scale than that. I yeah. Think. Um, but, but on that one, they have been very good with the marketing, and they, they have been doing a lot of yeah. work on on set. They have been able to mix a bunch of big names with more local. They have been. No, I think there's a, a group of them that they also target different institutions. They have been like a, I think I don't know, from far. I don't know what's happening. Mm. Well, like it's because like one of them knew manic. Which is the one bookshop by the world. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, 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 I might be wrong about this, but I think that's because I put them in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I vaguely think that's the case. And, and the reason for that is I just knew that those guys didn't need us. Like, they could do the job without us. And, and for us to step in, we would end up having to take a cut just to cover our own costs. That was more than their cost of production. You know, the chance of actually recouping their, their time and money and investment would have been significantly reduced um, and I just it didn't make sense for them but we would have happily taken it on um, because I know that they've, they've done such a great job with it um, but it just just in terms of the numbers the economics mm. just don't make sense for either party maybe oh uh, sorry can I add one more question on that like, would it from the perspective of the publishers and the architect as well if there was a glossy ad in the back of that Say, mm. say Inox or you know, Spain's finest producer of Inox or White Paint that covered the Inox. Would, would that, like, how would that relate to publishing for you or your work being displayed? Like, is an interesting question. Mm. If we were to say, how do you generate, how do you kind of, um, you know, mm. if you can't beat and join them, sort of logic, mm. but on your own terms, perhaps, is that, is that a pathway or of any interest? Or? Um. It's hard to speak for the whole group, <laughs> but, I, but for me, I think there's certain kind of practicalities that we might just have to engage with if we're going to increase the scale at all. Of the, at the moment, it operates pretty low print runs. I mean, we obviously, pref I think we prefer the book without it. Um, you know, obviously, <laughs> I, and this one doesn't have it. Um, and it's something we, we've talked about briefly, but haven't really gone down the, the line of, of pursuing it yet, just because we are operating it as like small print run. Um, uh, it, we don't get paid at all. Like there's all the labor is free because we all, we do it all in house. Um, so it's, it's literally paying for the, the, the printing is, is the large Wonderful. thing and, and mm. designers and um, contributors. Mm. At times some have been able to kind of 
uh, volunteer contributions as well. Um, so, but yes, I think, uh, I don't know, for me, I can't quite imagine how you would scale up without without something like that, I'm not sure. But I think there are membership models, donors and things like mm. that that are, I think in a book of this size, the advertising would be bad, personally. No, 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 yeah, uh, this size, is, yes. But, <laughs> but I think other books can take it and I think it's not, an, I think we also need to be careful that Australia thinks everything is for sale. And I think something shouldn't be for sale. Mm. And I think perhaps this one's is better to keep mm. them. Like, but you know, there are formats or there are other venues yeah. that I think it's fine. And, Projects we have done together, we have been fundraising. Yeah, well, we, we've had sponsors um, in some yeah. of our past um, publications, um, and that hasn't resulted in necessarily like a, a big ad, but there's you know acknowledgement of that in, in the colophon. Mm. And so, um, yeah, that's something that we're definitely looking into and, and trying to explore, you know, where's the line of, um, I guess, a editorial control, but then also whether it's just a glossy magazine with ads on the back. And so that's something that, yeah, that's kind of Zach saying, was trying to kind of navigate. Maybe if I can just add something from the perspective of someone who's worked for a um, publication funded by a developer. So one of the advantages of having money to spend is that you can really expand who you work with. So you're not just working with people who can afford to work for free, which to me was very important um, to be able to, to work with people who actually needed to pay rent, who needed to um, feed themselves, families and so on. Um, so it is... It is an important question. And I think this is the question that we're all kind of interested in. Like, how do you find the money? How do we do this? How do we do books like these in a way that is really financially sustainable over the long term? Can I also add to that? So I worked for several papers after Yana, and I was back from, I'm back from working mainstream media. So I just finished up a job with one of Australia's you know, best publisher, uh, mainstream news organizations. Let me tell you, working for a developer, way better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming.